We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Hello, friends. We are getting very quickly to the end of the year, aren't we? After today's episode, we have two more on our main podcast stream, and they are really big episodes, I think. I think you'll enjoy them very much. And then after that, we'll take five weeks off during which only our patrons will receive brand new episodes. And that's just a big thank you to all of you. Patreon.com forward slash Aust True Crime Pod is where you can sign up to become a patron. And let me tell you that the very first episode our patrons only will receive as their Christmas gift involves Narelle Fraser and her favourite boss, Lorraine. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it's gorgeous. Lorraine is everything we hoped she'd be in, even more. It's wonderful. I can't wait for you to hear it. Thank you, Eve. Yeah, I was going to say Eva, but no, it's Eve. Jenna, Carly by Norris. Oh, you've missed a trick there. You should call yourself Carly B, shouldn't you? I always fancy that Cardi B and I would be great friends. You know, like if we were neighbours. She and Offset were my neighbours. Oh, gosh, we'd have some laughs in the driveway. Kelly, Tracy Noonan, we'd be able to put a bit of shit on the neighbours, you know, it'd be good fun. Nikki Spring, Corkill, Dan and Sarah. Oh, and then Offset and I would go and put rubbish in other people's bins on bin morning. Dan and Sarah, I think I already said that. Jesse Brideson, Luke Leader, Lisa Carroll Vlogs. I'm going to have a look at your vlogs, Lisa Carroll. The trouble with vlog as a word is it sounds too much like vlog, don't you think? Tim Mackey, Taylor Kelly, Carly Smith, Jody Booby. Really? Why not? Tracy Bodenham, Brooke Lorraine Jeffrey. Hi, Brooke Lorraine. P. Jane Doe. Oh, dark. Bart, Brendan Cook, Ryan McBride, Dale Snedden, Georgina Kittle, Anne York, Sarah Down, thank you, Sally Ann Kearney, Samantha Rose, Tracy Dawson, Kirsten Ifold. That's an interesting name. I love it. I fold, I fold. Kelly Burton, Savannah Denzel, Wendy, Lauren Pruden or Pruden. We gotta try them all. Leanne Maloney, Megan James, Cara McLoon. Here's a screamer for you. C316-8014. Or is it C31 for short? Don't know. But it's all great. Hi, C316-8014. Megan, Matt Jackson, Lauren Phoenix. Thank you all so much for your support and for being patrons. Okay, on with the show. The following podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature and is not suitable for children. Shirley was made out to be bad and dirty and that stuck with her for the rest of her life. That's why I I chose to call the book Dirty Girl because I think that over everything else was the pivotal life-changing moment and from there on in she was used. She was used as a 14-year-old. She was used by pedophiles at such the institution. When she came along in the containment system, she had to not only pay for it, but also there was free sex that went on for corrupt officers. Shirley Finn's life and death have cast a long shadow over Western Australia for over 40 years. She first came to prominence as a larger-than-life Perth brothel owner during the heady first days of the mining boom. But then she was murdered in 1975, shot four times in her own car while dressed to impress in her famous flamboyant style, as though she'd believed she was heading out for a night of glamour rather than an ambush by the side of a highway. The crime remains unsolved to this day, but in the intervening years, men at the highest levels of policing and government have come in for close scrutiny as to their relationships, both business and personal, with Shirley Finn. At the very least, Western Australia's prostitution policy, known as the containment system, was unorthodox. At worst, it was murderously corrupt. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims and what happens next. Journalist Juliet Wills started asking questions about Shirley Finn's murder in 2003 and she's never stopped. 
Her book, Dirty Girl, is a detailed account of Shirley's hard life and callous murder. Emily spoke to Juliet about Shirley Finn's story, and I have to tell you without a word of exaggeration, it brought tears to my eyes as I was listening to it. I think this is a very special episode of Australian True Crime. I hope you're as moved by it as I was. Shirley Finn was a brothel madam. She'd grown up in quite a leafy suburb and top of her class doing really, really well, but discovered boys at quite a young age. And she was caught out uh, with a much older boy. So she was 14 and her, her father reported that she'd snuck out at night and he was worried about her and the police went looking for her and found her. And she was with a, a boy in his 20s. And this happened on two occasions. So the police dragged her before a magistrate because she was considered a wayward, out-of-control girl. And her parents were chastised for failing to, to keep her in. And she was put into Catholic laundries in um, Leaderville in, in Perth. And she was forced to wash sheets to wash her dirty soul away. And, and, and we've got the psychological reports from this time talking about how this vivacious, extroverted, intelligent girl turns from exactly that into a depressed girl that understands that, you know, she's dirty and terrible. At the same time, we've spoken to people that said that she was picked up from the home for wayward girls and um, taken out and handed around to the odd pedophile along the way as well. So Shirley, needless to say, went from being a girl who was top of the class, doing really, really well, to being straightened out, um, for want of a better word, by Catholic institutions. And from there on in, struggled. She did go back home for a while and she ended up marrying a Air Force pilot and she had her three children. Uh, he had an accident, got very uh, depressed and then sort of farmed her out to swingers' parties and things to help make money. They were quite poor and very worried about the kids and she was subject to quite a bit of abuse and she just was offered an opportunity to get in on the police containment system and make really, really good money and, and give her kids the life that she'd always dreamed of giving to them, which is what she aimed to do. There was only three madams in the police containment system here in Perth. So they were making enormous money because back then it was the big mining boom of the 60s. Things like Poseidon shares were skyrocketing. People were pouring into the state. It was a massive growth period and most of them were men as is, as the way of the mining. So there was enormous demand and lots of money going around for prostitution and prostitutes. So Shirley, financially, her life turned around and she was able to buy a very beautiful home on the river in Perth. She hosted fabulous parties. Even like Elton John attended one of her parties around the pool and everybody talks about how glamorous her home was and how glamorous the parties. People like to go and be seen there and, and Shirley's parties were absolutely fabulous but she had some very high level connections. Yeah and so what was the police containment system? How was it set up back then? Well it was basically a protection racket. Police still have never acknowledged that to this day. In fact we have been staggered over the years at the blanket denial about how the system absolutely operated despite numerous interviews we've had from people at the time and people that knew Shirley and including a, one of the three protected madams from the day who obviously Shirley's dead, she can't talk. But police have kind of dealt with this case with a wall, a brick wall. But it, it was a system where to stop yourself being raided and and ensure you could continue your business uh, uninterrupted and it included gambling and drugs and other criminal enterprises, you paid police. There was a, a bag man and some of that money went up the line politically as well. And uh, Shirley was the only one from Perth. There was two madams that came over from Sydney. The whole system was set up, I believe, with links to Abe Saffron, who was running a hotel over here as well. And the police officer who ran it was very good friends with Roger Rogerson, and they travelled backwards and forwards as well. So Bernie Johnson ran the containment system here in Perth, 
and um, he worked hand in hand with his interstate colleagues, in, in, in particular his close friend in the east coast was Roger and the brothels would share girls. So they'd move them around, keep them fresh, new faces all the time, uh, always trying to recruit and move the girls around and keep the business profitable. Roger Rogerson sort of pops up a lot in our podcast because of the nature of who he is and what he did. It's just interesting he pops up yet again in this story. So where were the brothels located? Yeah. Yeah, so originally the brothels in Perth were um, located in a, in Rose Street and in the, the, the 60s they all got moved on because they were working to build the freeway there. And this is when the, the Sydney madams were bought over. So we had Dory Flatman and Stella Strong who'd been running brothels. Uh, Dory had run seven brothels at King's Cross. She did tell me that she never paid police in King's Cross even though she ran seven brothels there, which I do find a little hard to believe and she never paid police here either so she continued to run brothels here for many years and was the biggest by far and they were kind of spread out but Kalgoorlie as well was quite an amazing it's like rows and rows of starting gates at a racetrack with, with girls standing in line in each of these places that was fully accepted there and right out Um, In anyone's face who drove through the town, there was just these rows of girls standing in cubicles that uh, men could go to. And indeed, another Sydney named Sally Ann Huckstep, who was murdered in Sydney, she actually started in Kalgoorlie in the starting stall brothels out there. I've read the book The Trauma Cleaner about Sandra Pankhurst and she talks about her time in Kalgoorlie and really explained a lot about how it was a place where it was like well, the Wild West, you could make a lot of money, but it did come with its dangers. Certainly a sort of very dangerous industry to be in, even though Shirley was running brothels that were in this police containment system. There's no doubt that it was dangerous, but like a lot of these madams, they relied on the fact that they held a lot of dirt on a lot of very powerful people. So they're in that situation whereby they learnt some of the darkest secrets of some of the most prominent people in town. And I guess in some ways they thought that that would protect them, but clearly in Shirley's case, it did far from that. There's a particular event that's not really being looked at by the inquest that was identified in 75 because Shirley was laundering huge sums of money as well for politicians, police and dirty money as well. And she got in trouble with the tax department and she went to her father who she never normally speaks to and said, you know, I need to borrow some money from your dad. I can't go to any normal channels. This is a really unusual sort of project for her to do. I need it because I've got this tax problem and I have a politician that's going to sort it out. Now, because of of this story from the father, we were actually able to get the caveat where this loan was secured at the time. So we had the date. And it's clear that the time that Shirley travelled with a politician to sort out her tax problem was during the 1974 Premier's Conference. And it wasn't the politician that we knew she was associated with the Premier here in WA. So it's fascinating. We always hope we'd get to the bottom of who it was and wondered if it wasn't linked to the events of politics at that time, which, of course, was around the time of the Whitlam dismissal. So this murder happened in 1975, which politically is the most politically charged period in Australian history. It was the time when Gough Whitlam was sacked. I was born in 76, but I know I studied politics that era a lot at uni. It it seems like there's never really been another time in Australian politics like that, has there? There definitely never has. And even even by today's standard, what happened and the, the way that was conducted was absolutely extraordinary and just uh, hard to fathom or justify. And there's a number of battles, uh, in particular at the moment, Jenny Hocking is still trying to get the palace letters released in relation to this event to see how much the Queen knew about what was going on here in Australia. And she's she's been battling for years and years to have those released. And that's a current battle in the court to this day. Yeah, I just love how that when you're talking about these things, there's so many threads. Tell us about what happened to Shirley. Tell us about the actual murder. 
Shirley was found with four bullet wounds to the head. She was shot at close range and she was sitting in her luxury Dodge limited edition sedan dressed in a full length pleated evening gown. The evening gown back in 1975 had cost $5,000. She had diamonds. She had gorgeous matching shoes. She was dressed to the nines. The car was right next to the busiest motorway in town. Like you're talking about for Sydney, like the Carl Expressway. It's like it's like being on the road across the Harbour Bridge. It's one of the busiest spots right near town. And the golf course runs alongside. You've got the river on one side, you've got the city in front of you, and you've got the golf course to the right right on the edge of the expressway on the Royal Perth Golf Club, um, Shirley was shot. And so this was a very busy road, a very public place. And it was like she'd been asked to dress up. Somebody found it somewhat amusing and said, come along, Shirley, to a ball, ha, 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 invited her in a public place where clearly they weren't even vaguely concerned about being caught and shot her in the head. So it was incredibly brazen and almost really sick humour in a way. Her daughter, Bridget, was home the night of the the murder. She was only 13 years old. She'd had a barbecue with her mum. Shirley, after the breaking up with her husband, had developed a relationship with Rose Black, a younger girl who was her partner at the time. And they were living in this beautiful house in Riverview Street with Bridget, the daughter. And she was obviously school age. She'd been sent to bed early. Rose had gone out. And Shirley went to the golf course, which was about two minutes from her home, and was killed. Now, Bridget is a remarkable young woman, and she's been battling with me for, (laughs) well, for longer than me to try and find out what happened to her mother that night and why police would not investigate the key suspects and why we were being shut down basically at every single corner. She eventually took a very, very long time for us to get the inquest, but sadly, as it's panned out, a lot of the people we really needed to stand up before us have passed away in the course of the inquest. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? The longer it goes on, it's maybe the less likely that justice is to happen. When you mentioned the pleated dress, is that the same dress as in the very famous photo of Shirley that we see where she's almost doing a like a curtsy with that stunning formal dress? It's got all the pleats in it. Is that the kind of dress she was wearing the night she was murdered? Yes, yeah, and and it's actually based on she loved the Supremes. Ah. And it was funny because her son Shane always told me, Mum always played the Supremes. And then Rose, when she stood up at the inquest, said, oh, yes, the dress was based on one by the Supremes. So it's a fabulous song. Bridget and I, uh, I took Bridget along and we, to a Supremes uh, reenactment show, and it was just fantastic because, you know, the dress, the time, the music was all very much part of her mum's life. She just looked like such a character. You can almost see the glimpses of the girl she was before she got sent to the Catholic laundries and then obviously running the brothels. How did you get so interested in this story? Because you've dedicated many years so much time into this case and getting justice for Shirley and her family. I went back to work after my children. So I'd been a television journalist and then I spent a few years at home with my kids and then was heading back into television journalism in the lead up to the Kennedy Royal Commission here in Western Australia, which was into police corruption. So I I was really... um, keen to show that I still had my straps when I was (laughs) coming back in. And I was running around trying to meet up with all the police whistleblowers. I wasn't from Western Australia. I was from um, Sydney originally. So I wanted to find out what were the big corruption cases and what type of things. I wanted to educate myself on all of those things. So in the course, at the time, the, the big story of the day was about the theft of gold from the Perth Mint and the setup of the Mickelberg brothers in relation to that. And I was meeting up with people associated with that case and this one kept coming up and people were saying, well, they won't go into that one because of who's involved. And I was thinking, well, who's involved? So I started asking around 
And people would just off the cuff say, oh, well, everyone knows who did that. It was the, the former Premier and this senior police officer. And I said, well, has anybody investigated them? Has anybody... Uh, have they been charged? They said, oh, no, they'll never do that. And I couldn't understand why, if everybody knew who did it, why police weren't investigating it and why they could be prosecuted. So I started on the course and I spoke to them, both of those, the senior police officer and the former premier, uh, and asked them all in detail, as I did, ended up doing dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews and by 2005 had, I thought, substantial evidence to try and get an inquest up and had we got it then, we would have the people that we needed to have Mm. to answer the questions about what happened to Shirley that night and why. What was the block in 2005? Well, look, it's the, the case is extremely complicated So the current inquest, as the coroner uh, has said, so there's a current inquest and the findings haven't been handed down in relation to this. There's over a million pages and there is a lot of conflicting evidence within that. So there are people that put Shirley in one place and then someone stands up and puts her somewhere else. You know, the crime scene, for example, we had a lot of people putting it at the the south end and some at the north. And then the crime scene map had the Dodgers being found at the south end of the golf course. And in fact, it was wrong. So even the police crime scene map was wrong. And evidence has gone missing, like there was photo albums taken in, which the police officer who collected the photo albums yet had politicians in it, but police can't find it now. So also things like Shirley was purported in relation to that earlier incident I talked about with the the politician, the father saying that she'd gone to Canberra with a politician to sort out her tax debt, Shirley's lawyer at the time, a QC, very well-known QC in Perth, came up and said, Shirley's father is mistaken. This was in the paper and to the Royal Commission. Shirley didn't go with an MP. She went with me. Now, when I got all the documentation surrounding that, that was absolutely clearly a lie and I could prove that. But, of course, publishers do not like to publish stories where a QC might decide to tie you up in court action because there's never been an allegation or claim against them and they've never faced any court or proceedings in relation to that. So I took that and said, look, you know this man's lied to cover someone in relation to a murder. Surely, I know he's well-known and respected now in Perth, but surely this should, you know, action should be taken. Well, they never did. So we could go nowhere with it. And naturally, publishers and everyone were reluctant to put that out there. So basically, there was no action against any of the people that were said to be involved. And all we could do was urge authorities to take action without Mm. results. After the break, the complicated lives of Shirley Finn's children. Coming up on Australian True Crime, Juliet delves deeper into the events that shaped the young Shirley Finn. But first, we turn our attention to the ongoing inquest and the persons of interest named. The standout name, named by multiple witnesses, including Rose Black, Shirley's partner on the night, is the retired Detective uh, Inspector Bernie Johnson, who was said to be head of vice and involved in in a number of criminal enterprises. And basically, they said he was the most powerful man in the police force, even though he wasn't the senior rank, but everybody went to him and he controlled what was going on. The the line that came out in the inquest was, he makes Roger Rogerson look like a Boy Scout. Wow. Yes. One of the others named was a detective, Don Hancock. Now, he's quite well known here in Western Australia in relation to the theft of gold from the gold mint, where he set up the Micklebergs, who have since been exonerated over over the theft of that 
gold. Some new evidence that came out was in relation to who the hitman was. A, a policeman stood up and said he, he'd had a very good source back at the time, and this was noted in the original serials, that Nettie Smith had been flown over to carry out the hit on Shirley. What are we waiting on with the inquest at the moment? So where is it at? So the the inquest has decided to wrap up because it's been going on for more than two years. And with the loss of a couple of the, the key people, in particular, Detective Bernie Johnson passed away in the course of the inquiry. So we weren't able to pursue the key suspects in any way. Quite a lot of information was coming in, but some of it due to the passage of time. You know, I can't remember where I put my keys last week and these witnesses were were being hauled over the grills because they couldn't remember the, the length of the, the trees and the shrubs around the crime scene and the level of light. So it was getting to the point where the lawyers were dragging these elderly witnesses who'd come up there through the, you know, wanting to re- recall what they did over the coals because they couldn't remember the length. One of them, it was quite extraordinary. It was just being grilled by the lawyers over really uh, insignificant matters and, and his te- all, all the rest of his testimony called into question because he'd got one of the height of the shrubs wrong, things like oh, that. Gosh. So it was really going, you know, getting into some quite obscure matters. I think there is there was a, um, a lot of talk and a, a, about corruption and because there's been six different culprits named, nearly all of them police officers, he's finding it hard to narrow all that evidence down. So it'll be very interesting what he eventually finds. We're probably, to be honest, not really expecting a lot. You know, it's been such a long, hard battle for us to even get it to the inquest. Um, We were surprised when we eventually did get it, I guess somewhat pleased, (laughs) albeit it was so late in the piece. And uh, I think, you know, Bridget and I have said basically, um, well, we've done all we can do with fought the good fight, we pushed up against them and said we don't accept police weren't involved. We really think someone needs to look at it. We've got them to look at it and we can't do any more. So uh, we're going to go on a holiday, we decided. You've done so much work. When when your book came out, which is called Dirty Girl, The State Sanctioned Murder of Brothel Madam Shirley Finn, what was the reception to that book like, Juliet? Well, it, it was interesting. It was, you know, it was quite explosive at the time. One of the the things that had never come out before was the testimony of Brian Eddy, who'd seen Shirley Finn in the police canteen on the night of the murder, and he was just a young motorcycle cop, and and he just said it blew him away what happened to him. He went and said, "I saw the lady who was murdered. She was actually at the police canteen." And then next thing, you know, he goes and starts his shift the next morning and he gets knocked off his motorcycle by detectives and has a gun held to his head and told to shut his mouth or he'll be killed. I mean, it was absolutely extraordinary. And these were the types of extreme stories that I was hearing that that almost seemed implausible. And this is part of the the issues for the coroner today. I mean, the fact that they would do that to young police officers, there was... A lawyer, a senior commercial lawyer I spoke to, when they went to inquire into this, they sent the cops over to Hong Kong. He got marched back and was held in jail so he couldn't testify. Uh, You know, so they treated lawyers like that. They treated police like that. That There was a witness who stood up and and said he was absolutely terrorised, you know, run off the road, threatened, guns. If they talk, I mean, this is Australia. This is not how witnesses should be treated. And it really is quite extreme, the stories we've heard in relation to this particular case. And Shirley was not really that old when she was murdered, was she? I mean, she'd obviously lived a pretty intense life and she'd had her three children quite young. Is that right? Yeah. So she had um, three. She was 33 when she was murdered. So very young. She had three children. They're all in their teens at that point. She'd had a few quite abusive relationships with men, including one chap who kidnapped her and tied her to a tree and left her naked at bush and she was found by a passerby. And so she had some, some quite 
horrendous relationships and then formed what seemed to be a pretty loving relationship with Rose Black, the lady she was with when she died. So Rose has always been someone that I've always seen her as a... She was from St Kilda and, and was turning tricks from a very young age. I've always seen her as a victim in all of this. She was an addict. Shirley had tried to get her off the junk and she loved her for that, I think, for cleaning her up. But, of course, after all of this, she went right back down the mine and has had a very, very, very tough life and was absolutely terrified to come to the inquest. And she talked about how she tried to get out of it and she um, had to be medicated. And, it's again, it's been extraordinary, 42 years on, how much fear we've seen from the witnesses in this case. 42 years on. Extraordinary. How have Shirley's children fared? Bridget was, what, 13? 13, yep. So both Bridget's brothers are dead. So mm. that probably gives you a bit yeah. of an idea. They both died in their 50s. Shane ended up in jail and uh, Peter Foss, the Attorney General of WA, looked into his case. He was one of three people, John... Button, Andrew Mallard and Shane Finn that, that they were looking at for wrongful conviction, that Shane Finn was set up for the murder that he was in jail for. I initially did, I've done so much on Shirley, I haven't gone into Shane's case. I would love some enthusiastic person to go into it in detail because I am almost certain Shane Finn was set up for the murder. Now, Peter Foss looked at the angle of the the, the got experts to look at the murder and said that there is no way Shane Finn with his broken collarbone could have done that murder that he was in jail for. But the saddest thing of all, when I asked Shane about it, he said, he said, look, there's no doubt that at the, at the time he'd been given a file on his mum from a police officer and said they will not deal with this police officer who's behind your mum's murder. And they gave Shane, by his account, a gun so he could deal with him. And a short time later, Shane was uh, was convicted over this murder. When I asked him if he did it, he said, you know what, my life's been so horrible, I've been virtually institutionalised. I'm better off in jail anyway where I'm somewhere. And I can't remember one thing about that night. He was drugged up. He was uh, he was on um, for his broken collarbone, various drugs, and then topped it up by drinking huge quantities and, of alcohol and was completely passed out. He cannot remember the night. But he said, you know, the one thing I am in life is a murderer and in jail, I'm cool. <laughs> and, wow. and I'm somebody. He goes out in the street. I can't cope. I can't cope with yeah. people. I can't cope with life. I drink too much. I end up doing drugs because I I just can't. I cannot cope with life. But in jail, I'm an artist. I'm respected. He did study. He actually won a top art award. He's actually quite philosophical, and that's where he preferred to be. So he actually didn't want at that point the pursuit of his case for wrongful conviction, even though the evidence by the account of the Attorney General was that he didn't even do it. He was there because he was going to go after the cop killed his mum. And what about Bridget? Because you've become very close to Bridget. Bridget is remarkable. She has had the toughest life. So she went from basically she, she'd been at private school. She was in a beautiful home. She got ripped out at 13 years old and she ended up in a home. Uh, Bridgewater home. Shane said that he stole a car to go and get her out because he couldn't believe what has happened to his beautiful sister, but then he got done for stealing the car. So you've got to some really, really mixed up kids here. Her other, The other brother, Stephen, he had a, a terrible car accident when he was young and it affected him for, for life and he, um, he passed away in his 50s as well. So Bridget's the only one of the three children still alive. Shane died of cancer. He really turned his life around. He always loved art and he became quite religious in the end, but he, he just had such a hard life. Yeah. It's so, so sad. It's, it's, sad. it's yeah. like tracking it. You know, you think, what, what would Shirley have turned out like if her parents just accepted some teenage rebellion she was a normal girl I keep thinking of that film the Magdalene sisters you know about the laundries 
the brutality yeah. of what she would have gone through. What would have happened to Shirley had she not had this, you know, horrible experience going into that place? Yeah, and everybody said she had a very strong business acumen and a really good mouth for for money. The, I, I think think there is no doubt, you know, when you, when you think that the year that she was put in there, 1955, mm. the boy that was having sex with her was committing the crime. It yeah. was carnal knowledge. Mm. She was a child. Yeah. No repercussions at all on him. And she has the life-changing event of being ripped from her family. And she had a sister and brother who, incidentally, no, uh, grew up fine without a hitch. So, yeah. I mean, that kind of tells you everything. Yeah. Shirley was made out to be bad and dirty and that stuck with her for the rest of her life. She lost her education and that that's why I, I chose to call the book Dirty Girl mm. because I think that over everything else was the pivotal life-changing moment and from there on in she was used. Yeah. She was used as a 14-year-old. She was used by a pedophiles, a sexual institution. When she came along in the containment system, she had to not only pay for it, but also there was free sex that went on for corrupt officers through the system and politicians. So, so they were kind of taking advantage of her. Then they were also using her to hide their dirty money offshore. And then she stood up to them and said, hold on, you can't keep extracting money and taking advantage of what well, girls and tried to stand up to them and they shoot her dead mm. and the, the terror from the girls that had to flee town as well they talk about how brutal police were towards them as well too so that they were living in in terror it was a form of slavery i believe the um the brothels yeah um back in the the day under the containment system were Shirley's parents still alive when she was murdered? Yes, they were. That, that was Shirley's father who went to the newspapers um, as a result of there was a fantastic police whistleblower and a civil libertarian as well that were campaigning back in 75 to expose police corruption. So because police weren't doing anything, they collected this material and interviewed Shirley's father um, about the, um, the, the fact that he'd been contacted uh, to help her out on a clandestine secret um, a trip with an MP to sort out a, a tax issue. So um, that that was that was um, her father that did that. Now I spoke to Shirley's mother, and when I'd read through her welfare records about how she'd psychologically changed and, mm. and their their pleas and the original magistrate records to give her another go basically that she wasn't a bad girl and that they'd make sure she didn't sneak out anymore but they didn't listen. I was so saddened by it and, and even though Joe Turing, when I spoke to him, that Shirley's father, said please don't contact my wife while mm. I'm alive because she would be furious if she knew that I'd spoken to you. I thought after he passed away and I read that, I just wanted her in her old age to know, look, it's not your fault. You, you know, she was taken off you. Mm. And anyway, I because I, I had a whole lot of records that I thought she probably wouldn't. So I rang her and she said, who's Shirley? I don't know Shirley. Mm. That was Shirley's mum. The whole thing is so tragic. It is. When I started this back in you know 2002 in the lead up mm. to the Kennedy Royal Commission, I thought this was an amazing case that had to be told. It was the highest level politically sanctioned murder in Australia. So the Premier, Ray O'Connor, was said to have ordered the hit and there is quite some evidence to support that allegation. So I thought for three to six months... That's how long I would be on this case. And yet I found myself year after year, I couldn't even get an interview with WA police. I ended up providing them with some of the material to show that there was evidence that this detective was at the scene, including Shirley's bodyguard, who'd said she was going to meet Bernie Johnson on the night of the murder. I'd had a, a top madam saying that, that they were paying Bernie Johnson 
quite substantial allegations against him. And yet, when I spoke to police, no, there's nothing to show that Bernie's involved in the case. So I'm, I'm saying, will you look at it year after year after year? And, and got nowhere, and I thought after 10 years, I'm going to put it away. This is ridiculous. I'm just busting my head against a wall and uh, really thought it was all over. And then, and then lo and behold, what, 16 years on, you know, all up, and, and we finally get the inquest and we're drawn right back into the thick and murkiness of, of this crime. Even though we've heard of police corruption probably in every state, still hard to believe that in Australia, like, it happens. It is really murky. And it has it sort of changed how you feel about certain things at all? Yes and no. I, I think think there is a real danger. I think that, that there is a lot of really good policemen that do really amazing and incredibly difficult job. But I think... It, yeah, when you get down to organised crime, we have an intrinsic problem with the way the court in many ways deals with it because you get up and you have to just look at the allegation against an individual, but really that individual is just a cog in a, in a, in a wheel. And by just looking at the cog, we're not grappling the, the great wheels in motion because... These crime enterprises weren't state-based. They were national-based. Mm. These same names. Abe Saffron had plenty of hotels over here that the cops from each state stayed in each place. They moved the girls around from state to state. The money all had to be hidden and laundered offshore by lawyers and accountants, etc. We tend to look at crime as if it's the corner store operation and we forget that actually... These became corporate, <laughs> and it's not the individual. That, that's why, you know, we see these people like Roger Rogerson and Abe Saffron came to Perth the week of the Finn murder. Now, maybe that's a coincidence, but maybe, you know, that, that was just part, you know, part of running the operation, but something had to be dealt with. And organised crime deals with justice far quicker and far more efficiently than the court system does. Why do you think she was murdered? I suspect, and, and this is something that the inquest cannot and won't get to the bottom of, that she was involved in a honey trap. I think it's most likely that motive was political. But I have to also caution that, that equally there was a strong corrupt coterie of police that were extorting large sums of money. She was going to speak to a journalist on the day that she was murdered. So whether it's the one that got most upset were the police or the uh, politicians that were at risk, I don't know, but I suspect them both. Juliet Will's book, Dirty Girl, is available in the bookshop on our website, australiantruecrimepodcast.com. Thank you for downloading. We'll be back next week. Emily spoke to Juliet about this story and I have to tell you without a word of exaggeration that I found Emily spoke to Juliet about this Emily spoke to Juliet Wills about Emily